Shalom and uh, welcome to a special edition of the Middle East Report on location in uh, Norfolk. We're currently at the home of a World War II veteran and hero, Derek Bowden. Not only did Derek serve with distinction during World War II, but he also played his part in protecting Israel during Israel's War of Independence back in 1948 when Israel was invaded by five Arab armies. And this is Derek's remarkable story. Derek, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to interview you today. Now, you were born on the 17th of December, 1921. Can you share something of, uh, of your childhood with us? Childhood, all very normal. You know, I had six brothers. And um, that was the main thing that was a, 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 a tremendous uh, sort of brotherhood. And we were very close, actually. Um, but they, they, they all, except with the exception of one, they were all older than I was, about a step of two years. In your childhood, did you always want to be a soldier? Oh, yes, no doubt at all. But it was, it was in those days, I should think everybody in any mod a modicum of sense would see that they were going to be a soldier anyway, whether they liked it or not. I mean, it, it just went on for years, as Hitler, the Hitler days, um, or the preparation for war. Um, we, we, we did everything we could, I think, to avoid war. In fact, we were almost branded a, a pacifist nation. Um, but um, it was inevitable. It just it, you knew the moment you were born, you were going, you were going to go into the army, and you were going to be in, in the war. Major Ord Wingate, British intelligence. They say I was something of a rebel in the British army. In '36, I was posted to Palestine the British mandate. Back in 1917, the original plan was to help the Jews build their homeland. At least, that's what a lot of people thought. Jewish pioneers were coming from everywhere and settling with farms and orchards and towns on the land of their biblical ancestors. It was just like the Bible said. The children of Abraham were coming home. Marvelous, simply marvelous. At first, we encouraged the idea of all this, even helped it along. But the government was using their best endeavors to block Jews coming to Palestine, totally on the side of the Arabs who didn't want any Jews there. To make matters worse, every night, local Arabs would band together and raid the Jewish villages, stealing, burning, doing terrible things. I refused to sit by and do nothing, nothing. I knew the way to end this was for the Jews to take the initiative, take the fight to the Arabs, instead of waiting to be attacked every night. I went to them and told them they had to fight. I mean, really fight. And you will not win unless I teach you how to fight and I lead you into battle. I trained them how to be guerrilla fighters, how to take the fight to the enemy instead of waiting for the enemy to fight you. But I did more than teach them. I led them, showing them by my example that good officers lead their men into battle, put themselves out front. Well, we put a stop to those Arab raids, at least for the time being. It uh, didn't go so well for me, though, however. The British Army didn't appreciate one of their own acting on his Christian faith and helping the Jews. In 39, they got their way. I was reassigned to London. But then, one of the young men I trained, 
was a real fighter named Moshe Dayan. He went on to become Israel's greatest general. According to Moshe, I taught them everything they knew. Not a bad legacy. To this day, I'm told, if you ask anyone in Israel about Ord Wingate, most often you'll hear them say, you mean our friend? At the end of the day, that's the best legacy of all for any of us, wouldn't you say? Derek, what was it like to serve under um, Lord Wingate, who is considered the uh, father of uh, the Israeli Defence Force? Yes, well, of course, in those days, he was comparatively junior, he was a captain. And um, he, he was quite an, uh, a person with sort of hands-on effects. Um, I always remember Wingate because um, uh, the, the first training I think of any sort that one had was with Wingate. And um, one of the things he used to do, because in those days nothing moved in Palestine except by convoy. And um, one of the favourite things was to stop at one village, take the Mukhtar, the elder's son, um, in, and spread them throughout the convoy. To, in order to pursue attacks by um, guerrilla groups. But um, it was quite successful, actually. But it was, it was um, a change to find a British officer who was thinking a little bit beyond the uh, um, Arabs and everything else who were actually uh, friendly to the, the, the Jewish side. So, so, Derek, when uh, World War II broke out, uh, you were posted in the British Mandate uh, of Palestine and the first action you saw w was in Syria and also in Lebanon. And you fought in the same war that uh, the great Israeli general, uh, Mushi Dayan, fought and lost his eye. What was that, that battle like? Well, you, you wouldn't call it a modern war today. We act, were really acting as scouts for the Australian infantry. On, with horses, and um, all of our weapons belong to the 14 war. Um, Hotchkiss, French machine guns, um, even the, rif the rifles belong to the 14 war. And the, the swords, I'm not quite sure when they'd be manufactured, but <laughs> certainly before the 14 war. Uh, um, very, very slow sort of war. We used to have our, a, a torpedo a boat that came out from Beirut, a French one, every afternoon regularly about two o'clock. used to come down and leisurely using the torpedo boat uh, as a, um, a firing point. They used to come down and shell the road. And no, you know, it was all very leisurely, boom, and firing at one lorry. I can even imagine a thing like that. And the lorry, the next lorry would attempt to make the road, and the the the, 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 the naval gun used to used to follow it up the road. Um, but it, it didn't last very long, and eventually, Dents. His name was Dents, General Dents. That was the uh, Syrian thing decided it wasn't worth the candle and gave up. And uh, all we came back with our little horses all the way back to Palestine again. And um, then the, I think that had woken up the, the people back here to the fact that they had thousands of troops out here doing very little. And uh, it was just before Alamein and they, of course, um, their main reason they weren't doing very much was they hadn't got any equipment. And um, uh, the, the uh, Wavell was the time, was the uh, commander in chief of the uh, Middle East forces, Wavell. And uh, he was taken over by Orkinneck. Um, and he took the opportunity to 
to, to, to take the Cheshire Yeomanry, which were a whole division, um, and to turn them into signals. And at the same time, they were going to form a um, parachute um, brigade. So it meant two trips down to Israel, one to learn to be a signal, and another one to, to learn to be a parachutist. The aeroplanes that we had at the time, they weren't really suitable, but Lockheed Hudson's, but then they did, they were really too fast. That's a funny thing to say, but those planes too fast, but parachuting is not much use. You should do well, we used to come jump into a slipstream of probably f up to 400 miles an hour. And if you didn't actually go down, you came back. <laughs> <laughs> and what were conditions like? What were the conditions like for British troops uh, being based in the uh, British Mandate of Palestine during World War II? Really, they were living in the lap of luxury. Butter, I can imagine it, butter. Um, they're back here, they were suffering rationing and God knows what. But there, they had butter and, of course, they had the inevitable orange. But they were looking after themselves very, very well indeed. And really, um, not much danger. This is the story of that glorious yet tragic operation, which in Mr. Churchill's words, will take a lasting place in our military annals and will in succeeding generations, inspire our youth with the highest ideals of duty and of daring. Airborne troops arrive by glider to take part in the toughest job of the war. Losses are not light. Crashed and burning aircraft are but a fraction of the price to be paid. But the red devils of the skies do not count the cost. They proudly offer life itself in their bold attempt to strike the short route to Berlin. Back on the road from Eindhoven, men of the Second Army go forward towards Nijmegen, and that vital bridge across the wider stream of the Rhine, whose capture intact was the most dazzling achievement of our airborne forces. That was the first objective of the operation, and it was triumphantly accomplished after a brilliant pitched battle. The second objective, the town of Grave, was also swiftly secured by the Guard's armoured division. Soon, our armour had passed through and was rolling northward. Derek, can you show uh, your experiences in, in Arnhem? Because the plan at Arnhem was that after uh, D-Day uh, that took place in June 1944, and this was the first time that the British and the Americans had a beachhead in occupied uh, Nazi Europe, the plan was to, to um, shorten the war by landing British troops or parachuting British troops into Arnhem in the Netherlands. Um, can you share your experience in uh, that uh, battle that didn't turn out well for the British? That was, again, uh, if you remember the, the, the Crete episode when the, the, the Germans used their parachute division and, and Hitler decided that the, the, the um, losses were so tremendous that he, w he just would not pursue that arm at all anymore. I w they kept some, I think, but they, they didn't um, increase it at all. Um, the, the general was student, von student, and um, that was really the same thing with Arnhem, that they, the generals using the arm didn't understand it, how it could be used. It was really used, um, if it's an obstacle in the way, that was uh, the idea that you would use the parachutes to jump over them. Well, it wasn't quite like that. And when they resisted, the Germans still had a lot of resistance in them. I mean, you, you would hear the bulletins, the news bulletins, and it sounded as if the war was over. But um, it wasn't over by a long chalk. When, the, when we really came up against resistance in Arnhem, um, and their generals face it were much better than ours. Um, well, I suppose they prepared for a war, that's the answer. Um, but they were much better than ours. A student, Modell, 
um, fantastic uh, people who fought in Russia and all over the place. Um, ours were more of a country gentleman type of thing. Our, our, our brigadier well, what was he? a country gentleman, really. In civilian life, he didn't do very much except live in the country. Um, Shan Hackett, he was in the, in the um, Transjordan Frontier Force, and he came across to us to form the parachutists. But um, he got very badly shot up in Harlem, and uh, they, they managed to save his life. And it was a British doctor that did it, actually, because he, he was um, in hiding all the time. How they managed to do it, I don't know. But, um, so, Derek, what, what was it like when you actually parachute into, uh, into Arnhem? Can you describe what happened to yourself? Oh, Arnhem, we, 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 we'd come to the day when we could... We used an awful lot of gliders for heavy equipment, but we, we were just getting to the time when we were going to use glider sledges. And we, instead of jumping with the equipment strung around you like a Christmas tree, you used to put it all into a kit bag, a big kit bag about as big as this. And it was attached to your leg and you used to pull a latchet and let it drop below you. And it used to drop about ooh, 20 foot below you and hang below. And it cut out the oscillations and everything. And uh, you could put a radio set in it quite easily. Um, mortar, mortar, um, uh, mortar bombs. Uh, all that sort of thing, and um, the the, um, the the fighting was really from the moment we, when we landed, we landed on an airfield, or well, wasn't an airfield, but a, a field which was in contest with the Germans on one side and the British on the other. It, not an ideal situation. And the 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 um, uh, foliage was all burning, and uh, we weren't very long before we were actually into action before we left the the landing field. But it, it um, we ran into very heavy fire because I mean the stuff we could carry in these kit bags was good. Etc. Etc. But of course, it wasn't heavy equipment. Of course, there's a sort of trouble with it, with, it, with with parachuting even today, although they can drop much heavier loads. Is that um, they didn't carry very heavy loads, but today, of course, they carry much heavier loads. Um, that, that's why all the, the use of gliders was so apparent. But of course, once the glider cast off, as you can imagine, you would think, well. Are they going to use these in the war? Because they 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 looked at it, they used to look as they were coming in, as if they were doing two miles an hour, sort of looking around to find a place to land, and um, they were very easy to hit. You could put you could you could put a small armored vehicle, armored tank in them, thirteen ton tank. Um, that would that would take one one tank, uh, and the, the the biggest glider they used to use was a horse, well a Hamel car, and they they, they used to um, come in very very slowly as they um, look for a place to land. We, we had two divisions of parachutists in the British Army, the sixth and the first. And um, the six were, I think, more successful than the first, or maybe they had better, better targets. I just don't know. Um, but the first always seemed to be unlucky that wherever they were dropped, there were Germans. <laughs> Too many. Because we were supposed to fight the Germans first. I suppose that was the object. And Derek, how, how did you get uh, wounded in the uh, Battle of Arnhem? Oh, I got a, 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 a landed, and the first thing that we found out, the 
that the wireless set in the kit bag had been fitted with the wrong frequencies. So that was useless. So you can just imagine that happening. Can you imagine it happening? Well, I don't know if it could happen today, but we had the wrong frequency. We couldn't speak to anybody. And we were there, the signal troops. I mean, useless. Um, but anyway, you, you could easily in that sort of fighting um, get wounded and not know. If, if you went to a sort of not very um, painful place, um, I mean, I, I, one time um, I was burning, um, a bullet had come very close to my neck and uh, set my scarf a, a light and a chap leaned over and said, you're burning. And uh, another time I got a bullet through the leg, I didn't even know I had the bullet through the leg until I got a bigger wound later. Um, but um, uh, an 88 millimetre gun hit a tree or a shell from an 88 millimetre gun and um, lucky it hit the tree and not me. But um, I, 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 I remember I looked down, it knocked me over and uh, they slid gear and I I thought, well, if I can find it, because it was quite a large chunk of flesh came off, you know, about six for two sort of thing, and a great slice, like a bacon slicer. And um, I remember looking down and thinking, well, I've still got the boot on, it hasn't been blown off, I've got the gaiter on and everything else, the flesh should be in there. And if I can find it, I can probably put it back on and bandage around it. It was rather lucky I didn't actually find it. Where it had gone, I don't know to this day, but it had gone. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Derek, you... Po probably gone into the meat ration, I should think. <laughs> um, uh, and Derek, you were you were caught by the uh, the Germans. Can you describe what happened uh, when you were captured by the, uh, the by the Germans? It was like something out of a a film action. First of all, I motored very gently in my own Jeep or in our own Jeep. I didn't see it on landing our Jeep, but it was there. They motored down to a, um, what we call an RAP, a, um, aid post, where there were a gathering of wounded people. And there were a lot of um, women there who had it seemed to me nurses' uniforms on, but they were homemade probably. They had a lot of crosses on, that's all I knew. But they unfortunately all got shot. But um, they used to say partisan and just shoot them. They, nursing to them was a partisan occupation. And uh, I was very lucky I went down there. I was only there about 10 minutes. Got in, a, in an ambulance and went into Arnhem. Well, now obviously Arnhem was overcrowded, so we we did get out of the ambulance and went and had were, were allowed to you, you put our leg or wound under a shower for washing, and um, we got back in the same ambulance and drove to the other side of Arnhem, a place called Eed, and. Um, there we were accommodated in two places which had obviously been prepared many years before. One was an ex-royal um, family um, palace and another one was a, was, a, was a large brick building all prepared with beds and um, um, medical staff. I stayed there for about five days. Um, uh, we were a long way from the actual fighting. Um, and uh, we, we went down to Arnhem and in this m m ambulance and came back the same way, all the way back to Eid. And uh, I was treated next day. Um, operated on and um, a, a, a doctor who spoke English 
And um, then we were sort of given rations and God knows what and put into cattle trucks and sent to a prison camp or complex near Hanover. It took about five days to get there because of the bombing. But, uh, I, I, all this time, hadn't really felt the wound. Didn't really feel it. It was just it was too clean and everything else. I'd put a shell dressing on it, a great big... But of course, the juries didn't have, didn't have many good dressings. They only had paper. Didn't, didn't have any cloth. And, and paper's not much good, of course, when it gets wet. But, um... Anyway, that took quite a while down there for um, it, it to become infected. It did become infected, unfortunately, and I was in terrible pain then. Um, but we managed to sell a watch for permission to go to the treatment centre, which was, wasn't German. It was just outside the wire in a hut, and that only took a few a handful of... Uh, Vitamin C, and um, the pain had gone, the thing started to heal, thank God. Amazing. And um, that, that was the end of that trouble as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, didn't actually heal until I got back from Arnhem seven months later. But... And how, how did the, um, the Germans look after you? How would you say your treatment was um, as a prisoner of war? Well, I think within their their means, because if you understand it, the, 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 there was an air raid twenty four hours a day, uh, either from the RAF or the American Air Force, and literally speaking, the ground was trembling all day long, where they bombed near Hanover or wherever it was. But they, I think, they looked after us fairly well. Um, they must have stocked up with potatoes. We used to get about three small potatoes a day. Um, we had three three cups of uh, what we called acorn tree. God knows what it was made of, but it, it was hot drink anyway. And um, we um, we had um, about three thin slices of bread. And uh, we did quite moderately well, I think. Um, th there was nothing for all these thousands of troops that have been captured in these battles to do, of course, except to go out on uh, collection parties for wood because it was a very cold winter. Very, very cold. This is the winter of 44, right? Very, very cold. Um, and uh, I can always, in my mind comes the um, these huts had been built to to house about four hundred people each. They would have about eight hundred at least to a thousand people in them, and what there was for beds, uh, bunk beds going up four four bunks. The chap on the top didn't have much of a chance, and with cross slats of wood as um, a mattress. The, the uh, um, Red Cross worked very well. We managed to get Red Cross parcels one a month for most of the time. Um, their organisation was actually second to none. Um, and, and that was a luxury, of course. It was clim milk, um, that sort of thing, um, oatmeal, um, porridge, um, tin meats, and um, that really made the difference. And of course, uh, the inevitable jams. But they they they, they were very well organised indeed. The Red Cross. Can you uh, tell us about uh, some of your daring attempts to escape from the uh, German prisoner war camp? Well, it's a funny thing about this, this escape thing, 
Because, I mean, all there is to do is walk round and round the compound, and there's a warning wire. Beyond that, you can be shot. Um, but something happens, I don't know. Anyway, one night I decided I was going to go. I'd had enough of this, and um, I, I just went to the wire. I walked over the wire. It was raining, and cut, there were two fences, one down here, one down there, and a gap in between. I just climbed up the fence, that one, and up that one, over there, and walked away. <laughs> And no one did anything. I'm sure all the machine guns were mounted. They were probably in there keep having a game of cards out of the rain, I think. But I just walked away. Well, anyway, cut a long story short, I fell in with um, some French railway workers who used, what they used to do is fill in holes, I think. They, they were railway workers anyway, and they, they took me on and um, kept me with them. And um, it was, eventually they were ordered to, to move away. And um, I gave myself up again, gave myself up to a, a, a street patrol, or SS street patrol. And, and, and that was it. But I must have upset the chap I was talking to because we got onto the subject of Palestine, and um, we were getting on quite well. And then I must have upset him about something because he said, "Oh, well, the Jews." He said, "I'll show you how we do with the Jews. You will send us to one month at Belsham." Now I had no idea where Belsham was, but I soon found out. And our, our job was to push railway trucks. Oh, there were empty trucks mounted on rails, I suppose, um, and load them up with dead and dying people, which um, quite a salubrious occupation, really. And um, I, I was very lucky. I, only, I did one month exactly, exactly as he said, um, and then went back to prison camp. So can you describe for us really what the conditions were like for those oh, uh, Jewish prisoners it, it, in Belgium? Quite, quite appalling because there was no accommodation at all. I mean, there was accommodation. or oh, that been filled up long, long ago. And the, 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 the camp was holding about four times as many as it could hold. Um, there were, I've, I've forgotten the name of the... There was one woman in charge and a man, I've forgotten their name now. She, her, her um, private uh, entertainment was making lampshades out of human skin, which is, um, I suppose, it's an occupation of a thought, but they are, what was her name now? I think they did get round to hanging her eventually, but, um, it was just literally speaking. There was nobody in Belson that wasn't wasn't uh, either a German or um, dying. But um, we spent. You know, you didn't have to push this great truck. Truck would be about the size of this room, on mounted on rails, and it would be several of you to push it, and you'd load it up. Most of them would be dead that were on board, and they push it to the, the end. At the end, what you everybody was dumped in the hole. I did, never saw one of any machinery for digging these holes, but they had plenty of holes. Um, and then back to a prison camp, and. Uh, that was like uh, being in, in, in the Ritz. What happened when you were told that uh, the war was over and that you could return back to prison? Well, we were very efficiently dealt with. About 24 hours, we were back in London. And um, I, I still had two years to serve. I, I was a regular, but... Um, uh, I, I, I had three months of leave 
first of all. And it, it, I thought it was a horrible time. I mean, they didn't want the army anymore, but they couldn't get rid of it. And um, and then this, the, 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 tr the trouble seems in Palestine that it was going to be turned into a war. I mean, according to the Egyptians anyway. Um, and uh, I decided to go. I was in the Territorial Army, but um, as a regular in the Territorial Army. And uh, I packed it all up, um, resigned, and um, flew out, BEA, believe it or not, to um, Cyprus. And uh, back to the world that I knew, more or less, because I didn't know anything about civilian life. Didn't know anything about it. Well, I, I, anyway, went to Cyprus and, and anticipating difficulties that didn't exist. I thought it'd be difficult to get into Palestine because you're hearing nothing but blockades and blockades and blockades, but not as far as I was concerned. I ran into a pilot in Cyprus who was running a regular um, charter business to Haifa. Uh, sure enough, I went with him, cost 20 quid, I think, um, to uh, Haifa. I've been given the name of a uh, Haganah recruiting uh, lawyer. I've forgotten his name now. Um, uh, anyway, in the... In the, in the, the um, had a Harkam or he had an office there in a, in a, in, um, a hotel. And um, I went to see him. It wasn't very much of an interview. And uh, he moved me into a hotel on Mount Carmel. And uh, very shortly, two, three days, I was telling Telefinsky, uh, that's where I took the name David Apple. I knew a family, I had known a family for years and years called Apple. I knew their daughter very, very well. And um, so I just put, tacked the old David on to it. It's easy enough to write in Hebrew. And um, from then on, it was David Apple rather than my own name. Um, can I ask why? Can I? It's such a big decision. I mean, you just survived uh, the horrors of World War Two. You you were in a, a German prisoner of war camp, which you tried to escape on a couple of occasions, uh, and you could have taken civilian life. Why did you decide to go and join what was then the the Haganah to fight uh, with Israel for her war of independence oh, after I the state was declared? I had it. I mean. May? The only experience of life really was in it was in Palestine, and I got on very very well with the with, with the Jewish people. Um, I was very lucky, of course, that, the, that I was in the cavalry, and they were sort of in residence patrolling. They used to patrol on horses all over the country, and um, I got to know the country very very well. It was like a well, it was more than a second home. It was home, and. Um, when I heard they were going to have a war, and of course with all these Egyptian speeches at the time that they were going to throw everybody into the sea, it was fairly obvious that one was going to get involved in a swimming lesson or you, you were going to resist. Um, but anyway, they didn't throw us into the sea. We didn't throw a lot of them into the sea either, really, I suppose. Um, we, we, we got... Um, three flying fortresses, one of the first things that the Israeli Air Force got. Then where they got them from, they'd have gone from America, I suppose. And um, the, the first time they used them, it was only a comic opera in Cairo, with all the anti-aircraft guns shooting at each other. Uh, but um, it, the, 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 the first thing they were going to do, of course, were very grandiose plans. 
I saw Ben Gurion very briefly, about four times. I suppose he used to see every comedian that came along. And um, I wanted to talk about um, parachuting because I thought there were definitely at that time dozens of um, ex parachutists, SAS, um, Belgian parachuters, French parachuters, and um, I thought we would literally speak and only have to get them together in a unit and we'd have a really good fighting unit. But um, it, it took a lot of doing, and I don't suppose we had an awful lot of equipment. But they started to form this English speaking brigade, and so I decided to get involved in the war, and I went away and joined the uh, 7th Brigade. Of course, getting involved in the war was a misnomer. I was really got involved in recruiting the, the ships as they came into Haifa, the illegal ones, used to offload and um, come to the 7th Brigade and get formed into units. Um, I had a, a company of um, H. Het, that's right, Plugar Het, um, um, and we used to get there arranged that they got a bed to go to and um, that they were fed and of course in some cases clothed um, but um, the, the, the seventh brigade was at the time commanded by an American a chap called Wright and uh, he didn't stay very long a few weeks and then um, someone from the Jewish Brigade, Jack Lichtenstein, um, Nurseller, he changed his name after the war. Um, he, he was a, a, a good chap, but you know, I never remember him having one parade of the, of the battalion. You'd think he would have done that to um, say, well, here I am, I'm your colonel. You, you, you have to like what you've got, but he didn't do that. No, no. And, and Derek, many of the uh, the fighters that were fighting in Israel's uh, war in, of independence were were Holocaust survivors. Can you can you share with us some of the uh, colleagues that you fought with in that uh, very brave and courageous war that that uh, Israel's engaged in, probably the most costly in Israel's modern history. Holocaust. I I, I didn't I didn't. Have have a lot to do with um, uh, people from the Holocaust. The main reason is because they were they were, were not trained in the army, and that there was no, that there was very little training going on. Although they were trying to get it going, um, they were not soldiers, um, and they 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 used them, of course, all over the place. They used them in the Mishnah team, the uh, strong points. Um, in something something like Dad's Army, I think. Um, I had a company of um, Amer Americans and um, Americans and um, mainly Americans and British, and some Sabras, or a few Sabras. Um, we cleared the Galil, the Galilee, um, of. Um, the remnants of the Arab armies, what you can call them armies, and um, we took part in the, in, the, in, in the line. We got a, a kibbutz, Machanaim. Um, I, I took a company there, and um, we had our platoons out along the line. But very little fighting, very skirmishing. If anything, um, I used to go out in the jeep at night and moat around the whole lot of them. Um, but it was quite sort of, um, um, what would one call it, a um, uh, basis between wars, a uh, piece of wars.
what was actually like when, when the war was over and uh, Israel had survived this, her first major battle against five Arab armies? Yes, well, she chose her enemies very carefully. <laughs> 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 I mean, the Egyptians were some, don't forget, they've been trained by the British for years, but they were no good. <laughs> but the rest of the, the, I mean, the Saudis didn't really have anything. The, the, the Syrians thought they had something. Um, they actually had to have some armour. Um, yeah, but the, 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 the Arabs never managed to, uh, um, what would you call it, um, c c collaborate to the degree of working as one. They never managed to do it. The, the Egyptians were the main um, danger, really. Um, they had an air force too. And that, of course, that was because of the British. The British had trained them and they trained them quite well. But they were useless. That was really what it was about. They had modern equipment too, some modern uh, aircraft. It's Spitfires and um, Dakotas, Dakota aircraft. Um, so how, how did you feel here, standing with the Jewish people, fighting with the Jewish people, fighting for Israel's independence, and yet uh, your own government uh, was actually supplying the arms and the weapons to the Jordanians yes, and the Egyptians? Yes, really. I mean, and, and they actually flew one or two patrols for them. Um, but they eventually decided that it wasn't a good policy and they, they pulled out of that, that policy. It was a very stupid policy. And as of Iceland was in, engaged in one of those where they shot, I don't know, three? Shot three, three down and landed in hospital, RAF. But of course, if you compare someone like as of Iceland with the pilot of that time in the RAF, he'd be far more experienced and he would be sitting in the sun, as they say. He'd be up there already. Um, but they stopped that after a while and the collaboration ceased. But it, it did, did start. And um, I was very frightened at the time that they were going to um, involve Britain in a war. She'd come back. But it didn't happen, thank God. That was a, a very, very serious worry, as a matter of fact. And then uh, after Israel's War of Independence, uh, you stayed on in Israel for an, another year to actually train uh, Israeli paratroopers and actually design the manual for, for jumping out of aircraft. Yeah. Um, can you describe what your role was and how that you helped the IDF, particularly well, you the paratroopers? Know, we're talking now... And and I, I can't remember unless certainly, but we, I never had any in writing, very rarely anything except verbal orders. And the way I actually started was that I was sitting in the line, the 7th Brigade, with, with, a, with a whole company of troops, and uh, just doing normal patrol duties. And um, a whole delegation of I've been writing letters and making out training programs and all that sort of thing because I had plenty of time. But suddenly these people turn up and they're people I knew from the um, Jewish Air Force, from the Israeli Air Force and from the army. And they turned up and asked if I would go and um, form a parachute school. Someone must have got hold of one of the training programs or something and thought this is a good idea. They had attempted to form a, a, um, a parachute school, but it had been an absolute failure. The main reason is that they didn't seem to have anybody in charge. Um, but anyway, um, I remember I had a jeep. They gave me the, the jeep to uh, transport. I left the 7th Brigade and just motored off to find a barracks. I said, find a barracks and set it up and get it going. They thought it was like that. You could do it tomorrow. But of course, it needed a little bit of planning 
and um, I'd done all the planning beforehand, but I mean, um, they wanted planning and, of course, materials. We had to have something, um, even millets, parachutes. But I motored off, and the first place I actually visited was, was Telnoff. And um, I hit on a, a portion of the camp there which was not used, an ammunition dump. Well, ammunition dumps, of course, were used for storing ammunition. They're not to live in, but anyway, I took that over, and um, it, it was practically impossible to live in because it had it was one sheet metal between you and the Israeli sun, which was not um, enough reduction uh, for heat. But anyway, we we did we managed to set going, and um, we 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 set our first. Um, 12 sergeants on a course to, to learn how to instruct and in a small arms course. And then they came back and we put them on a, a parachute course. And uh, we ended up with a, a, um, a wings uh, ceremony where Ben Gurion came and handed out the wings the parachute wings, um, which they were all very proud of. And um, they were all fairly well-trained parachutists. Most of them had, by the time they got their wings, had a hundred jumps. And um, we were very, very intense, of course. And uh, I, I sometimes used to do ooh, two or three jumps before breakfast in the morning. Just get up and just take them one another. Luckily enough, the um, the aeroplanes were very near to the dropping zone. Um, you Literally speaking, you just took off and jumped. Took off and jumped. And you could almost walk back to the uh, the, uh, the, the aeroplane. Um, a lot of um, dune country, sand dune country near Gadira. That's where we used to jump. Uh, Derek, you've been um, honoured with this award called the Mahal Award uh, for your bravery and, and courage fighting as a volunteer uh, in Israel's War of Independence. What does this mean to you to be honoured by the Israeli government and by the Israeli Defence Force? Uh, really, frankly, uh, you, 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 well, you'll come to it, I hope. Um, but when you're of great age as I am, um, you look back and you tend to think, well, what, what have you achieved? What have you done in all this time? I believe that the only reason I was probably um, put on the earth was to, to, to go and serve in Israel, to help um, recreate that ancient nation. Um, I, I thought that all, all the time. Nobody ever doubted that, I don't think, that um, it was a, a prime objective. And I think that's the only, the only real reason one has been given this long give it here and a long term of time. But um, it, it, it won't be very long before a hundred years has been achieved. And I remember someone said, said to me when I left the army, they said, this war gone for 50 years, well, it's been going on for longer than that, and it's still going on. But we, we made mistakes, of course, like many. We should never have allowed Gaza to go back. Now, that was silly. I mean, we shouldn't allow that to go back. I know it meant casualties, but war means casualties, I'm afraid. You can't do anything about it. Um, you, you, we should have kept Gaza, and uh, we should also, by now, have a, a division of troops. And we, it would terrify uh, Egypt, but Egypt, of course, now has made peace, and there's no need. Um,
what does Israel uh, mean to you? Because we know that when uh, you joined as a volunteer, um, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, back in 1948, when you helped Israel's war of independence, Israel today is a military and economic superpower in the Middle East. It has one of the best armies in the world. Um, what does Israel mean to you? Well, I suppose you can say, so I live here, so it's a second home, isn't it? Um, I don't, don't travel now, but um, it, it, it's most important. Um, uh, and a feeling, of, in a way, that one had something to do with it. Um, and um, through immense difficulties, because of course, the difficulty of me arose from the fact we hadn't got the equipment. But um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have happened. Um, here we are, we, we all have a written, well, all, well, the Christian nation anyway, has, has a, a written history in the Bible of, of the ancient nation, and it's come back into being. Um, I believe it was... Um, God's will. Um, that she should. Why? Why are you using direct methods? I'm not quite sure. Because if you think it was all powerful, you just say, right, it's going to happen. And it would happen. But things definitely are not done like that. Uh, Derek, I just want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to having the opportunity to interview you today. Uh, a real hero and uh, thank you for what you've done in saving this nation during World War II but also playing your part in defending the one and only Jewish nation during Israel's war of independence and now when I see an Israeli paratrooper I'll think of you Derek. That's thank the legacy. Thank you.